Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Scuttlebutt episode number, I don't know, the official podcast of the National Museum of the Surface Navy and the Surface Navy Association Battleship Iowa chapter. We are uh, here aboard the Iowa in the middle of the summer. Yes, very much. With no air conditioner. And uh, so we've got the fans blowing, but the amazing Moran will try to scrub that noise. So hopefully by the time you hear it, that noise is scrubbed. I'm Jonathan Williams, president and CEO, and it's been several months since I've joined the podcast, I think, at this point, because I've been busy, focused on uh, a rebrand of our capital campaign and working on our story, which is highly relevant in today's uh, podcast episode um, with our guest, Captain Dick McKenna, who's retired U.S. Navy and a uh, friend of mine we've known for several years and it didn't literally didn't dawn on me until last week when he walked into my office that he had a very real and relevant story um, to what we're starting to do which is talking about freedom of the seas and the united states navy and especially the surface navy's role in safeguarding such um and so uh you know let's let's start out dick why don't you give a uh, uh introduction of your who you are and a little bit about your career uh, yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Yes, uh, retired uh, U.S. Navy. Uh, I uh, am out of the class of 63 at the U.S. Naval Academy and have been uh, pr primarily uh, surface Navy uh, destroyers, destroyer escorts, amphibious, and uh, battleship New Jersey, and uh, several staff uh, things. I've had uh, three different commands, and... Uh, in this particular instance that we're going to be talking about, I was XO of the USS Kirk during the evacuation of Saigon. Great, thank you, Dick. And so, uh, one of the one of the mission areas that I think uh, you know is less talked about, and we're starting to really work on that through the National Museum of the Surface Navy efforts, and especially our Freedom of the Seas campus, is the humanitarian assistance side of things. Um, we kind of look at the different alignment, you know, safeguarding trade and commerce. Um, ensuring, you know, safeguarding the seas uh, for all nations to enjoy, especially in the principle of freedom of the seas. But the Hater mission, the Humanitarian Assistance Disaster Relief Mission, has a very relevant course that I think that, the, frankly, the Navy, Navy and the Surface Navy have gained very little exposure, especially in the public space and the civilian space, on, on what that's done to um, give back to society. And it's, it's really happening on an everyday basis. Um, it's kind of a relevant conversation considering what's going on right now, which I don't intend to dive into. Um, but, you know, when, when Dick walked into my office last week, it, it just kind of rung straight in front of me and said, wow, I, I, here's, here's an icon that actually experienced it um, firsthand. So uh, let's flash back to 1975, which, by the way, is the year I was born in. So I don't know what <laughs> month this happened in, but that was the year I was born in. Um, so hopefully that doesn't age it too much. <laughs> Well, Jonathan, yes, it, it does. Uh, it is amazing how, how far back this was. And uh, it, it just started as a normal deployment. Uh, we, we left in early March from San Diego. Uh, the first inkling that something was up, although, you know, we were getting all the transmissions that the North Vietnamese uh, were really moving in on the South and things were uh, really getting very bad. But uh, after an exercise that we had, a uh, RIMPAC exercise in, in, uh, off of Hawaii, we were held back to escort the USS Hancock, who, who put down a whole bunch of their air wing to embark Marines, a Marine detachment. A normal transit to uh, the Western Pacific is 12 knots, and we did the whole thing at 20. Wow. We, uh, we got there, and things were basically stable for a while. You know, uh, we, uh, we were knocking around, doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And actually, the fall of Cambodia happened first, and we were sent over to do that. Had, had very little to do with that. It was the evacuation of the embassy, and, and that was all. But after that was done... They said, okay, go on to Singapore, you know, have, a, have a, uh, an R&R &R for several days and everything else like that. Day after we got there, uh, get out of here, get, you know, get, get on station. We were put on station 
off of Vung Tau. There was a screen of ships. Uh, you know, we were one of about 20 ships, but we were the closest one to Vung Tau. And uh, this is getting into late April. Things started to deteriorate fairly rapidly, and the next thing you know, the 29th of April came along, Saigon was falling, and uh, we had ourselves a, uh, a, a flight of Hueys like you wouldn't be seeing. The, the, the sky was filled with Hueys. Now, the Marines were evacuating the embassy, but this was all Vietnamese helicopters fleeing on, on their own uh, and, and looking for a place to land. So, so um, let me ask you real quick, surely. did you did you wake up that morning knowing that any of that may occur? Or well, was yes, it the operation, the operations orders were, you know, very, very good. And, uh, you know, uh, we were prepared. We were okay. prepared for basically anything. You know, there, there was a little concern that uh, the Vietnamese Air Force the North Vietnamese Air Force was going to possibly give us some problems as well. And uh, but the our air force was flying cover. Scary thing incidental to that. Uh, I'm I'm hearing over the command net the the air force talking to our uh, commanders uh, Seventh Fleet. We thought H hours was going to happen three hours later, and so on and so forth. Oh my God. And so, so you know, there's the the usual uh, I shouldn't say usual confusion. It it to me was a, a signal for later on that these joint efforts had to be very very joint and and you know really really clear on everything. So anyway. Um, I have a little bit of a side note. I don't know how much time yeah, we, we have. Oh, we have, we have 30 like minutes, so go okay, for it. Okay, well, uh, preparatory to this, on our way back from Singapore, we needed fuel. And so we were, we were in the process of lining up for refueling. We weren't the only ones. There was a whole bunch of different things. Uh, and uh, anyhow, our squadron commander, the, the, uh, the surface uh, squadron commander, was not pleased with something we did, which we don't understand to this day, but it, uh, we got a message saying, your peripatetic ways are, are viewed with displeasure, Goya. And I said to the captain, what does Goya mean? He says, get off your ass. <laughs> now, my captain uh, was, was not a guy who, who took any of this, uh, you know, s sitting down. And so he wrote this message that, scared me to death and so i said please could i uh could i you know dust this up a little bit i did uh you know we said and you know we're and we're very proud of our reputation yada 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 and and that was it so okay back to uh the <laughs> evacuation and the the helos flying everywhere uh all of a sudden we get this and this is like two days later and at, with us at 87% fuel, proceed to refueling. <laughs> and from this squadron commander, the captain took a deep breath and said, sorry, we're in, in the process of recovering aircraft. We had not recovered any aircraft at the time. He basically just, you know, did that. And, and well, subsequently, we, uh, we did have, uh, we did recover an aircraft shortly thereafter saved his bacon as it were but uh, uh you know who did we get we got a two-star general from the general staff we got a a high priest of the hua house sect from the uh, from the uh, mekong delta uh you know and uh and that was the first helo oh. now these guys didn't didn't you know i mean they're not uh familiar with landing on a on a flight deck of a of a, a destroyer slash ff that was uh, the designation at the time uh but uh so but that was our first helo before all was said and done we recovered uh something like 17 helos wow. uh, first and second day a dozen the first day and as you can imagine we were pushing a lot of them over the side. Wow. We, we did save several of them. And uh, yes, in the cruise book, you can see pictures of everybody 
heave hoeing on the on the the helos, uh, you know, to to drop them over the side. There was one special helo, a CH-46, that was entirely too big for our flight deck. He wanted to get aboard, but uh, but we couldn't have that happen. So uh, with a lot of hand signals and everything, we put him over our fantail, our wide open fantail, and uh, he was hovering at about 10 to 15 feet. About 20, uh, 20 some odd people came out, and one of our sailors, uh, we had volunteers under, under there to, to, uh, to uh, you know, take care of the people as they jumped out. Oh but uh, we did have a bundle ha come out, and it was a baby. It was a baby that was just they into just, this, like, into this guy's arm. Wow. Yeah, yeah, well, dropped. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily a throw. <laughs> Just Go dropped it 10 yeah. to 15 yeah. feet. Yeah. Basket. Had a basket. Wow. <laughs> no, no. Uh, so, so that was a pretty singular thing. The pilot then uh, mover, maneuvered off on our starboard quarter, put the, uh, the helo gently down onto the, th that, had it roll right as he jumped out oh on God. the left side. And uh, as one of our Texas crewmen said, he looked like an upside down dead armadillo. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and sank rapidly, of course. But we were able to uh, rescue, rescue him with, with our uh, whaleboat uh, and uh, several enthusiastic sailors jumping off the fantail to swim to him. And, you know, we had to recover them, yeah. too. But that speaks to the enthusiasm of the crew. The crew was turned on to this in so many different ways. Humanitarian to the people that we, uh, that we received. Uh, uh, you know, uh, they, they were people, uh, there was people who were giving our, as we were registering with names and everything, there were people giving us gold, par, gold bars and pieces that we wow. had to basically return, no thank you, and, and so on uh, like that. But uh, you know, it was it was it was a, a, a an inquire, uh, require require entire effort. Um, so that was the first day, and it was hustle 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 the whole thing. And the captain and I are sitting in uh, the wardroom uh, roughly about midnight, going, "Oh, I wonder what else is going to happen." How many people Plane, did you extra people did you have on board at that point? That time we, we rescued about 157. Wow. Uh, with a lot of equipment too. We stripped the helos before of anything that was salvageable uh, before we dumped it. Uh, but yes, we're we're in there and all of a sudden we hear plane in the water, plane in the water. Well, um, this uh, helo ditched up our, off of our starboard bow. The boat was in the water again, and uh, we rescued two Marines from a Huey Cobra who basically ran out of fuel. And we don't know this for a fact, but we suspect that they were the last Marines out of, out of uh, Saigon, you know, flying cover for, for the embassy evacuation and so on and so forth. But uh, so we got them and, you know, sent them after that. Now, uh, Please feel free to ask answer ask I, questions. I'm curious how you guys had enough uh, birthing for 157 yeah. extra oh, people oh or no, food we, or anything. Uh, this is this is tarps and mm -hmm. as as many blankets as we could put on our upper deck, uh, you know, forward of, of our or aft of our uh, Mac, which is our stack. They call okay. it a stack. So yeah, no, this was this was uh, not the case. Um, wow. The next day, we, we uh, took a few more. We took an Air America Hilo. We, uh, uh, our, our pilots, who I didn't mention that our, uh, our helicopter itself was down for repairs, uh, they, were, they were into it as well. They, uh, uh, we, we had, we had uh, all kinds of people that they, they would be talking to and everything. We had a lady who, who uh, said, oh, I didn't know this was going out to sea. I, I thought I was heading to Canto for my family. And there was a guy who just was dropping people off and going to Canto, so they put her on and everything. We subsequently heard that they made it back out uh, as well on another, on another flight to another, uh, air, another ship. Uh, 
But uh, anyway, uh, this, this went on, as I said, until we had, I think, about 170 all told. Wow. At that point, it was over, uh, and we were, we were told to rendezvous uh, out at, uh, in my mind's eye, 50 to 100 miles offshore. And so this is the evening. We're coming up on the loom of all these lights, which were uh, charter, charter vessels that were handling barges that were being towed, filled with people, uh, fishing boats filled with people, you know, and so on and so forth. And that's, that's ultimately how we evacuated uh, all these, these folks, you know, we, we sent them off, we said goodbye. At that point, we were called by Commander 7th Fleet to come alongside and for a special passenger. So we go alongside early the next morning, I think it was, and, and uh, aboard comes this uh, gentleman in a coat and tie. <laughs> uh, and uh, with orders for us to proceed to Kansan Island. Okay, what are we going to go to Kansan Island? The captain is, you know, he's, you know, could you confirm that there, this is this is it? You know, Where we're worried that? about air cover. Kansan Island is about a hundred a uh, hundred miles south and offshore, and had notoriety in the past for for tiger cages and, you know, uh, the prisoners uh, oh, that, wow. uh, that were there. So uh, it had a bad reputation. And, you know, just as a little sidelight, when I had my LST command, I took prisoners to Kansan Island. And all I saw was them unloading ships and all of that. I actually went to church there and so on and so <laughs> forth. So, it, you know, it was one of those. So you didn't see the tigers? <laughs> no, I, I didn't see uh, anything like that. But, back, but you did unload p prisoners there. Oh, yes, I certainly did. I certainly did. Oh, my did. gosh. Wow. And, uh, you know, so that was LST story. Anyway, um, so back to, uh, to this. We get to Kansan Island. Oh, and the story is that this is a Mr. Richard Armitage, a name you might remember mm -hmm. now, yeah. uh, you know, for his future in, uh, in, in government. But he was the liaison, the official uh, Navy liaison uh, to the, the Vietnamese Navy. And as we arrive in Kansan Island, we see about 20 some odd ships that uh, are just teeming with people, just absolutely, you know, to the gills. And, uh, and so basically, uh, we, we take him alongside the command ship, which was in us, nothing more than a, you know, an old Coast Guard cutter. It's one of the bigger Coast Guard cutters. And uh, he, this is for him to meet and liaise with the general staff of, of the Vietnamese Navy. So we, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of side stories that, you know, I just don't want to divert too much because the essence of this is we, we, our mission was complete, and the captain with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, our Commodore, we had a, a, another Commodore embarked uh, on our ship, uh, decided that, you know, we need to stay here. We need, you know, we need to help with the escort on this. So, the, so we proceeded at somewhere between four and five knots, which is the top speed of some of, some of these uh, vessels that were going there, and uh, proceeded to the Philippines. Like I say, a lot of side stories. We, we came upon a, a, uh, a merchant ship filled with people as well that wasn't, uh, that had lost all propulsion. Mm. And, uh, oh. you know, we, we had to, we went aboard with a, with a repair crew to find out that there weren't any, any engineers aboard. The closest thing to an engineer was Premier Two's tennis coach, who was down in the engine room, and uh, 
uh, they, they had just filled what, what was called the day tank mm -hmm. for the fuel, and they just ran out of fuel, and they didn't know how to get the fuel back to, back to the main engine. So how how did they even get moving? Well, they got, they got moving because they, they had the fuel to the, to the main engine. Yeah. But once the day tank it was mm -hmm. empty, duh, you know, they, they didn't know the process like, of turn the cross filling over. it. To, yeah, w which one to I do. I assume they had actually some mariners actually controlling the ship, right? It wasn't like just... <laughs> They didn't Mariners, randomly yeah. grab Mariners whatever maybe, ship they could. Merchant, merchant, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm a boatswain. You're an engineer. And so they could have just grabbed this beach. ship off the beach in Vietnam and just took off. Yeah, yeah, basically, or Saigon probably. You know, went down from Saigon, especially if you're talking Premier Two's tennis coach and and all of that. Um, <laughs> wow. So, uh, so uh, in essence, oh, and they would they thought they were they were sinking because they were leaking fuel, uh, and it was just. Uh, the, uh, the the water uh, portion of the mm. uh, the bearing for the, the main engine bearing you know the thrust bearing yeah. that, you know that you you lubricate so anyway that that's another one that was solved although somehow they they had set up a three-tiered uh, society the rich guys the, the uh -huh. semi-rich guys and the poor guys who weren't getting any food so I got sent aboard with uh, a couple of uh, a couple of sailors armed and so on. Mm -hmm. Had to settle that one out. That uh, that that was fairly easy, and uh, as well uh, and and so on to the main portion, which was that we were visiting. Oh, and and subsequently another frigate, and uh, an amphib, and uh, a uh, salvage ship joined us as part of part of this uh, array but we were going aboard all of these ships and these other guys as well to check for medic medical situations and and uh, things like that uh, we were providing food yeah uh, this uh the uh, amphib ship and i uh, sorry i f forgot the, the name of the ship but uh, you know we can get back to that if, if need be uh, we we unloaded through our stern transom for our for our variable depth sonar. We unloaded something like about seven tons of rice. Wow. To uh, you know because we we were dumping our own larder. You know I mean I mean yeah. we we were running out of uh, all uh, the juices and liquids and and food and and things like that ourselves. You know the storage rooms were getting kind of empty. Anyhow, uh, yeah and and. <laughs> In one of the visits to uh, you know to to uh, put this off, we got no more rice, no more <laughs> rice. Uh, so just a lot of these little humor things. But a human interest story is that uh, we were going aboard these ships and we were finding at term or near term pregnant women. Oh yeah. We found something like about nine of them. We converted our first class cruise lounge into a little, well, it's not like a, like maternity, a maternity ward, board. but it was a place for them to be, as well as, you know, it wasn't just the women, it was their families. Their families were coming as well. So uh, my good good old playful captain, and he was very, very playful. That's, that's a heck of another story. But anyway, come on, ladies. We need to have a baby for the Kirk. <laughs> and and our hospital corpsman, you know, was kind of <laughs> tearing his hair out about all this, you know. So anyway, so so there we go. Um, we had a couple of deaths. Oh wow. Huh. We had uh, we had a baby that uh, was aboard with a kind of a pneumonia, aspirated, oh, and, no. and we basically had to have a service for the baby. Mm. Uh, as we got closer to uh, the Philippines, there was a problem in that the, uh, the Philippine uh, uh, government had recognized North Vietnam oh. already, and so they couldn't take these Vietnamese vessels. So basically, we sent several of our junior officers chiefs and everything and had changes of command and, and converted these to U.S. Navy vessels. They f we flew into 
Saigon, uh, into uh, uh, Subic Bay with uh, under, the, under the U.S. Navy flag. Wow. Huh. As we're getting ready to do that, we had another death. And it was a poor young girl who was so terrified she overdosed. Oh, and uh, we brought her over to the ship, but by that time she was gone. And so we had to bury her at sea as well. And so then there we were. We were in the Philippines. And uh, we were there for upkeep uh, for a couple of weeks until the Mayaguez incident. There was a Mayaguez incident where the Cambodians had captured or were ca about to capture this U.S. flag merchant ship and all that. So we were dispatched for that. But a day or so into our transit, uh, the problem was resolved. They, they, you know, we weren't we weren't part of that issue, so we were sent to Guam, where the refugees were. And incidentally, I I, I didn't mention that this was something like about thirty two thousand was the wow. was the number on the ships. Wow. Um, and as I'm talking, there's all these other little side stories. But the side story I want to get to is that we go to Guam. A lot of our crew go over to see if they can't see these, uh, some of the Vietnamese that we had rescued. And what do you know? One of the, one of the ladies who had given birth, and there were several, several who, who gave birth, was Tran Nguyen Kirk Tien Giang. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, we had, we had just what the captain yeah. had asked. <laughs> Maybe okay. named after Kirk. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's it. Good. We we let we. Uh, I, I just this is uh, this is <laughs> Very this is why this is this all exists right now. Um, we lived happily after, ever after. Went on cruise for a, another four months or so. Uh, getting back October the fourth. Great port visits, uh, Korea, Japan, uh, you know, Hong Kong, you know, the, the classic uh, Navy cruise after that. And so that's it, okay? Uh, until about 25 or so years later, uh, the, uh, uh, somebody decided to have a reunion down in San Diego. And, and it was great to, uh, you know, I should have checked on, on the timing on this, but I think it was around 25, 26 years afterwards because, because of what I can remember is the Midway had just come in there as, as, a, as a museum ship. And, and we, we did a little bit of uh, fun on the Midway, among other things. But what did happen there is one of the guys said, I wonder what ever happened to that lady who named her baby after the Kirk. It was very enterprising sent a, a letter to the National Vietnamese newspaper and hey, she answered up. Oh, wow. And when she answered up, she was right here in Long Beach. No. Wow. And, uh, and you know, I, I was over at the Marine Exchange. I was ex uh, executive director of the Marine Exchange at the, oh no, I was uh, deputy. Anyway, <coughs> excuse me. Anyway, uh, she comes over with her daughter and uh, has, you know, yearbooks full of Christmas stories and family stories and her, her husband. She was only 17 when, when she wow. was with, with child back then. And so we, in essence, at that, with that juncture, reunited with the Vietnamese that were, uh, you know, that we were able to uh, assist and all. And uh, so after that, and it was like within a year or so after that, we had another thing in, in Orlando where, uh, where, the, uh, where we had a, a reunion, Vietnamese as well as, uh, as uh, you know, uh, the crew. Oh, that's and cool. since then, we've, you know, we've had various things. Uh, I, I was mentioning earlier that uh, the most recent was in July, 
a dedication to uh, to the to the captain Jacobs, our, our captain, with a plaque in Westminster uh, Vietnamese Memorial yeah. Area uh, for all his effort, and there was a big ceremony and so on and so forth there. So uh, that's that's the essence of the story, and I mean, I, I sort so of did it. A so bit so would you say, like, how did that? You know, change your outlook. I was about to you know, ask like, that. How did that yeah. change you, even the way you look upon things? Uh, well, the one, the one thing that I always, you know, I don't know, it always seems like my anesthetist is named Nguyen, or, you know, there are so many Vietnamese that have, have prospered out of this that it's, it's a, you know, it, it's just sort of very warm and, and gratifying. Um, the... You know, okay, pick your pick your side. Did we win or lose the war, or you know, all of that? Uh, it, it it just showed the Navy's attitude, and and you know, subsequent to that, the Navy's attitude uh, has has been there all the time. You go over on deployment, and that's you've heard of the boat people, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And and you know, so that that was a constant for a while, and uh, and so. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's it's part of the mission. It's always part of the mission to be able to to be able to assist where where necessary. Uh, so so do you think? Because because a lot of like what I what we've been digging into is is uh, and I've done two presentations um, in front of groups this week, and the what's fascinating to me is is I would say under ten percent of the room knows what freedom of the seas is. And less than that knows what the Navy or surface Navy does yeah. within that realm of things. You know, did, did, yeah. was it that way in 1975? Do you feel is that I, like no, are we further I, away? I than think it's always it's always been uh, there. The only the only thing is there's there's so much in the terms of cool stories about the Navy and and all the adventure and the excitement and you know uh, like you know big guns and so on and so forth. That it gets lost in the yes. noise. Okay. It just gets lost in the noise. But the Navy's out there, and if there is a problem of any kind, they're, they're going to be into it. They're going to, yeah. you know, you don't, you don't just walk away from stuff like that. That's, yeah. a, that's a that's a sea thing, a, a boat thing, period. And it's even more so, I would think, in the Navy. We're uh, we're uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, an a, a ocean bound nation. Yes. And and the traditions of the Navy go way back from there. I mean, you know, ours is incidental, and you know, they tell us that it's the the greatest uh, uh, mass rescue in the history of the Navy. Uh, and okay, fine, but it doesn't mean that you can't find instances right from the beginning of the Navy uh, all the way on through. And there probably are. Now, can I say off the top of my head? No, but uh, there was there was a story just recently of uh, the Navy uh, uh, captured a boat with 300 slaves on it. Uh, you know, way back when mm-hmm. they captured the, that boat, the slaves were all returned to Africa yeah. before, before that. And so there's there's you know that's just a recent off the top of my head thing, but. You know, doing doing some research, I, I'm sure that you could probably find a heck of a lot of yeah, stories it's a, it's just a, just like that. It's a thing too, because everybody always thinks of the big guns and the World War II battles and all, and that's the yeah. sort of major perception of the Navy. But sure. I mean, the very start of it was protecting our citizens abroad. Yeah, and and a, a, you know, a hoot to the Coast Guard too. That's yeah. a that's a surface yeah. Navy affiliate. They yeah. you know they 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 work uh, very closely in hand, and so. Drug and a drug, uh, you know, interdiction. Yeah. You know, that that happens in the Caribbean and, and things like that too. So that that's a that's a crime thing, but the humanitarian thing is is really always there. Well, and, and you know, part of my presentation I'm doing is you know you got the humanitarian thing, you got protecting trade and commerce, you know, anti piracy, all of the normal elements, you know, that may have some more exposure, but then you start to look at illegal fishing operations, mm-hmm. uh, human smuggling. Yeah. You know, yes. and, and you go yeah. down that whole, you know, the, the, even the fact when you take a cruise ship across the water, the ability to feel that you can take that cruise safely um, wherever you may go, that's because there's an ever presence of knowing that those waters will remain safe from from 
people that may want to take over that cruise ship and make it their own, right? Yeah, yeah. And make them right. think twice. Yeah, no, that all, all of that is, is applicable, right? You know, I mean, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's good that you're looking to widen the aspect of the, you know, the, the need and the, uh, the, the stories of the surface Navy. Well, and I think it's right. important for the conversation, especially here at the Port of Los Angeles. I mean, you've been here in San Pedro for some years and, and the busiest cargo port in the nation or Western Hemisphere. And, uh, and, and really to be able to get this stuff over here safely is, you know, once it enters the port, it's not thought of, but yeah. getting it from one port yep. to another, it's getting it moving is, is a whole different gig. It gets taken for granted. Yes. Yes, yeah. very much. Yeah. 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 And so we're, we're, uh, trying to raise that awareness. So great. Thank you for, uh, yeah, sharing you. that story. Surely. Yeah. If you think of other stories, write them down and we'll have you back. Exactly. <laughs> Definitely. We talk about New Jersey stories one day. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dick. And yeah. uh, signing out here from the uh, Scuttlebutt Studio, um, the official podcast of the National Museum of the Surface Navy in affiliation with the Battleship Iowa chapter of the Surface Navy Association. Yeah. If you've got any comments, questions, feedback, or anything, usually, I mean, as usual, hit up that LA podcast at LA I can't even talk today this is just sad podcast at labattleship.com if you've got any of those and thanks so much Dick thank you my pleasure and thank you for asking so <laughs> <laughs>